This exhibition, Regeneration, Black Cinema 1898 to 1971, really teaches people about chapters of film history that they didn't know about before. Most audiences have no idea that there was this really vibrant Black film culture in the early part of the 20th century. Regeneration is a, an exhibition that really looks at seven decades of African-American cinema or participation in the film industry, both in front of and behind the camera. We also look at sort of Hollywood participation as well as independent filmmakers. This exhibition really shines a light on an industry and a set of performers and directors and writers that have been largely invisible to mainstream audiences. There's so much to speak about and a lot of content. We knew we wanted to talk about what does it mean to be from that time and going through this experience. What was really important for us in our exhibition was to highlight black filmmakers, their creativity, their resilience. And in particular, you can see that in independent cinema. Race movies were films that had black casts that were made for black audiences during the days of segregation. It's difficult to determine how many race films were made, but 1915 through 1940s are when they are the most predominant. Race films were kind of separate or independent of Hollywood. In Hollywood, black filmmakers were not offered these opportunities. In particular, black actors very often were cast stereotypically. When you have all of these sort of social obstacles, you had race films charge ahead saying, we're going to push this sort of black modernity forward and we're going to do it understanding the power of the storytelling. So in these race films, we have a huge array of film genres and storylines and opportunities for black filmmakers to tell richer and more comprehensive stories that relate to black life in America. Many of them are lost, or at least we don't know that they exist except through the beauty of Negro press, writers, film critics, and through posters, which we show quite a few within the exhibition. So Regeneration is actually the name of a race movie, and it was billed as a romance of the South Seas, like an adventure film. Unfortunately, like so many race movies, it was missing for a long time, and it's incomplete. There's only one reel of it left. So Regeneration refers to that film, but it's also a way of talking about how generations of Black filmmakers have inspired each other. They have been regenerating more positive images of the race, and it's a way of pointing to the importance of film preservation as well. curatorial team wanted to start the exhibit with this Glenn Ligon piece, Double America and The Kiss. And the art curatorial team talks about that really starting the duality for the exhibition throughout. Duality played a really important role for our exhibition. And we set this up right at the beginning of the show where we have a piece that references duality quite literally. So when you first come in, you see a piece called Double America 2 by Glenn Ligon. It's a neon sculpture that has the word America at the top and then a kind of reversed version, upside down version of America underneath it. It kind of references for us and also for the artist Glenn Ligon, the double consciousness that wonderful uh, sociologists and philosophers like W.E.B. Du Bois already coined, if you will, for the black experience in the early 20th century. It's this brilliant, brilliant reflection on how the race question in this country has produced very different but kind of mirroring experiences. Being an American and an African American, having always a duality in their lives. So when we think about this movement of early black filmmaking that we talk about in the gallery we're sitting in now, you have the classical Hollywood films that are being made, but you also have this parallel industry, this kind of shadow industry. You had black filmmakers and people conscious of sort of the power of imagery continuing to do good work and continuing to create film. And that is what we're really trying to sort of point out in this exhibition. This is not a new phenomenon. Black filmmakers and actors and artists have been involved in it and they had to sort of create their own kind of pathways. 
curatorial team always talked about always starting in a positive note and the exhibition is so much about the positive aspect of the show and how much of a content there is. The first image that you see, something good, Negro Kiss, featuring two vaudevillians in 1898. I don't think most people would ever think that African Americans were in films in the late 19th century. It really highlights two vaudeville performers in this wonderful, playful exchange that is kind of a play off of Thomas Edison's The Kiss. It is a seismic shift in the ways in which we understand motion picture and black participation in the industry because you see these well-respected, internationally known performers in this 29-second clip acting without blackface, without this sort of stereotypical minstrel visual representation. In 29 seconds, you're able to say they are dismantling preconceived notions of blackness. They are removing these prejudiced and predominant understandings of the ways in which black people were often being imitated and portrayed and reduced to being. And they are also responding to something that is part of the mainstream lexicon of the day. That is a really powerful, daring way of understanding and asserting yourself through film. I'm really excited that we are able to include contemporary artworks into our exhibition next to the historic memorabilia and historic objects. All these artworks allow us to create dialogues between the past and the present. Part of what we have here are just these incredible objects. We have a pair of cowboy boots that Herb Jeffries wore in an all-black western from 1937 called Harlem on the Prairie. We have a costume that Lena Horne wears in the film Stormy Weather. The costume of Lena Horne, a dress we feature in our exhibition that is from a private collector and he allowed us to restore this amazing dress and it's so rare to find costumes from the 1940s anyway. It's even rarer to find costumes from people of color. We have a Soundies machine these were machines that were like visual jukeboxes where you could put in a coin and then they would play these short musical films that are precursors to music videos. So in the soundy machine you can see these soundies as they were seen at the time in cafe houses and taverns and restaurants, in public spaces. We have soundies of Dorothy Dandridge when she was really young before she had a Hollywood career or Cap Calloway or Louis Armstrong and so many more amazing talents. Our second gallery, which is one of the biggest gallery, we have a case study on Norman Film Company. There is a tripod. We chose to put that in the middle of the space on its own on an island and really emphasize it with this beautiful lighting in a dark space. And we pointed it towards the posters that are on two walls completely full. We wanted to show this in a symbolic way to showcase uh, how much of sheer volume of film that were being produced from 1920s to 40s. So those are some of the ways that we just try to bring the material history in addition to posters and script pages. So we try to tell the story through really carefully selecting objects that not only are interesting in themselves, but hopefully get people really curious about what else is out there. We have in the exhibition the Glamour Wall, where we feature over 50 black stars that worked in Hollywood between the 19-teens and the 1950s. Never in my wildest dreams did I think that there would be an exhibition like this, where people from all around the country, all around the world are coming through and they're learning about Louise Beavers and Mantan Moreland and Oscar Micheaux and Spencer Williams and they're learning that Josephine Baker had an incredible career in film when she was in France. And they get a chance to learn more about dozens and dozens of black performers, many of whom didn't get credit in the films they appeared in or never got to be in starring roles. We really wanted to show through a map of the United States that these film productions did not just happen on both coasts, but they happened throughout the entire United States. We want you to learn more about each state's production companies, the independent all-black cast film productions. 
It's a scholarly show and it's a complicated history and there is a lot to digest, a lot to understand. And as an exhibit designer, your role is to highlight the art objects or the filmmakers or the narrative at large and to have the architecture set up or created in a way that is complementing the piece. It's all about these quiet, beautiful moments. How do you intrigue a visitor to keep their attention? We wanted to make sure there is enough room for visitors to really contemplate and digest the information that you're looking at. That continues on throughout. All spaces feel really big and sparse in that way, even with a lot of content, a lot of didactics. As you can see, we really play with like darkness and light in this exhibition in a unique way. And it covers so many artists. I mean, dozens and dozens of people. It's an exhibition that as you move through the seven galleries, it's quite monumental. And I think that it is giving people a sense of a long history I'm excited about the fact that we move all the way through the late 1960s and early 1970s. People who might know something about black film history with regard to the black exploitation era, like they might think, oh yeah, Shaft, Superfly, that's kind of where black filmmaking started. I mean, we have six galleries before you even get to 1971. So they're learning that there's a much deeper history. What we're really trying to show in this exhibition is that this is not a new phenomenon. Black filmmakers and actors and artists have been involved in it and they had to sort of create their own pathways. And that to me is, it's an American story. It is a story of resistance. It's a story of the power of art and daring that it takes to sort of push through despite all of the things that might be sort of before us. You have to continue to dare to dream. Mm -hmm.